Hello and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today I'm talking with Hans Joachim Brocher-Seifer and Mark Treschel Schmitz, the director and DP respectively of uh, The Expert at the Card Table Looking for Erdnays, which is a documentary about the writing of the very important uh, magic and card cheating book, uh, The Expert at the Card Table. Um, as I've said a handful of times on this podcast, I am a lifelong magician, whether or not uh, people believe it or expect it. Uh, <laughs> and so I reached out to uh, these guys, to see if they wanted to talk to me about the documentary, because uh, it's actually very fascinating. The For those of you who don't know, which is probably most of you, um, like I said, The Expert at the Card Table is a really important book in card cheating and, and magic. Um, and it was written in the early 1900s by someone called S.W. Erdnays, except that person doesn't exist. They, there's no record of one ever existing. So uh, this documentary is, you know, trying to figure out who that was and also uh, does a great job um, reenacting, so to speak. Uh, I don't want to give it away too much, but there's a lot of um, scripted elements as well. You know, what what you would call reenactments. But maybe these things didn't happen. Who knows? Um, it's a mystery. So uh, the guys actually sent over a little making of featurette, a little eight minute guy. Uh, that I'll play right after I'm done talking. So um, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. If you're just listening, you'll hear it. Um, obviously, that's how those mediums work. Um, but if you are not interested, just skip eight minutes from when I stop. And that's about the end of it. Um, but it's interesting, so I don't know why you'd want to skip it. Anyway, uh, I am going to let you get to listening and watching. So uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with the filmmakers behind the expert at the card table. The movie tells the story of the person behind one of the most influential books in magic, particularly in card magic. And it was written at the beginning of the 20th century, and we don't know by whom. The author is anonymous, he used a pseudonym, S.W. Erdnays. So the movie is... Uh, diving into different theories of who this person might have been. I started doing magic when I was 15 years old. So in some way, uh, the fact that I'm a member of the magic circle here in Germany um, is due to the book, The Expert at the Card Table. Of course, for my exam, I performed most of my tricks out of this book. And only later on I uh, figured out that we don't know who the author was. And I decided to, to make a movie about the book I'm so grateful for. I was immediately hooked when he showed me that S.W. Erdnays um, turns to E.S. Andrews. And that, that was the moment where I thought, oh my god, there's something. <laughs> I talked to some people who did the research, so to the to the most prominent, so to say, um, and to people uh, having archives who could give me some articles I, I wasn't able to find on the internet. She gave so much to to the story because she put uh, conflict and and drama to to every person to every piece of dialogue, basically. I chose this specific genre for the movie in order to combine the modern magic world with the historic background. And this is what the movie plays with throughout the film. So we decided to go for a more traditional filmic look. Uh, so no handheld camera, just static or slow moving dolly shots classical composition and also we lit in a more traditional way with classic film ratios. Always sort of a discussion in the in the film industry, can you make digital look like film? I started to do my own research and sort of develop my own method and in the end I'm quite happy with the results we got. I think it works, it gives the movie a, a quite distinctive look and separates those scenes. The character, Erdnays, is slightly odd. You know, and he's portrayed as being slightly 
almost otherworldly. It's kind of like, okay, what's, you know, you can't really see what's going on behind the eyes or what's, what is his motivation. We were really lucky to have Florian uh, Bayer to, uh, to be our Erdnays in every scene because uh, Florian is a magician himself. Florian and I knew each other from back in the magic circle and he was there for my exam and he was also part of the very first short film I ever, I ever shot. I play four different characters or three different characters depending on whether you assume that the actual Erdnays is one of the other three or not. So I don't even know whether I'm playing four or three characters. Uh, this was my biggest ambition. I would say that when we show tricks on screen, there is no visual effects. So everything you see in the movie when it comes to sleight of hand is done on set. So we had some extremely talented sleight of hand artists who have specialized especially in the Erdnays techniques. We also work with Moritz Müller, with Semyon Zidanov. And then Hanyu himself, the director, also did some of the slides. So all three of them used their hands to pretend to be my hands and made me look good. Of course, the clothes uh, were very different uh, back in those years because um, the beauty standards and also the situation at, of the time was quite different. The fabric changed a lot, the shape changed a lot. Yeah, so it was some um, very interesting research and also work to um, recreate those historical costumes. We built the United States from 1902. We built all this as a set and as different sets uh, all over Germany. So what I remember most about the set design was um, seeing it for the first time and when the, the building that it was shot in was already quite old and, and sort of of the time, it was quite good. So I didn't think there was going to need to be an awful lot done to the, um, to the rooms that we were filming in and then when I walked in there and there was these amazing wood panels and it just like took it right back to the time, it was, it was perfect, it looked really good. We had to change the German way of construction from the room to the American looking apartment that we see in the movie. At the time you could enter the apartment and we had the newspaper office uh, and next room we had the bakery and then uh, in another room we had the Milton Franklin apartments. For me the scene in the train was sort of the most challenge because we needed to have a moving train. So we, it will be a train station somewhere and we have to make it move. We had uh, our lighting department uh, was quite creative. Uh, they built something like a wagon out of wood uh, where they put the spotlights on um, and then they could move it by the window of the actual train so uh, they could make it look like the train is actually moving. So one of the weirdest and biggest problems I actually ever had on a, on a film was Hanyo's entry to the USA. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to travel to the United States uh, when we were shooting most of the interviews. Hans visa was cancelled by the US government or so. We don't know why. Uh, we uh, actually still don't know why. All of my colleagues were allowed to go, but I wasn't. And for all the interviews, uh, Hans was there online via Skype or Zoom, and uh, that's how we shot those scenes. Working on this was the best work that I've ever done in my life. It was the most fun work that I've ever done in my life. In general, being on a film set, I think, is uh, the most enjoyable professional environment that you can be in, unless that is that your director is an asshole. <laughs> and luckily, Hanyo is the most wonderful person to work with. 
it's quite challenging to to shoot such a big project uh, with a rather small budget and we we wanted to get the highest quality we could get and I'm just very thankful to be able to be involved in such a project with so many people uh, who were so involved and to sort of work the extra mile. The way I normally start the podcast is by asking everyone um, what got you guys involved in in filmmaking, not necessarily or art in general, not necessarily how you got started in the industry, but um, you know what what got you interested in being a, a creative individual, especially um, a magician. I've I've mentioned on this podcast before that I was a magician, but I never got to talk about it, which is half the reason why uh, I invited you all here to talk about this film. Um, but uh, Hans, let's start with you then. Uh, how I got started with filmmaking. Um, I started trying different artistic things when I was in high school, just as a way of expressing myself when I was dealing with, with um, I don't know, emotional, difficult situations and stuff like this. And I tried a lot of different things from music to, to painting, uh, drawing and, and all of that. And I wasn't good in any of that, like at all. Um, so then I found magic, not film, I found magic first. And I was about 14 or 15 years old. And this was something because not a lot of people were doing it. I was able to do well enough to maybe impress some people, but also for, for people to simply notice what I was doing. And um, yeah, so I got into magic when I was 14, 15 years old. And uh, a few years later, I also got into photography and I loved uh, uh, retouching in, in Photoshop. And it was a little bit like magic to me. You could also make things levitate and you could also remove things and, and uh, stuff like this. And while I was in school, I was also working in uh, CGI a lot because I was doing a lot of animation and 3D animation. And then all of this sort of came together. My love for photography that I built over the years, that I had a background in uh, VFX and CGI, and um, this magic element, which film always had to me. Uh, and then I decided that I wanted to study motion pictures, and this is what I ended up doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mark? So I basically, as a child, I always liked to draw and paint. Um, and I remember the first time I went to the cinema as a little kid and I was immediately fascinated. And uh, even when I was quite young, I liked making offs and watch behind the scenes stuff. And I got really fascinated when you see the movie and it looks like a movie. I didn't know, but it just looks like a movie. I didn't know why. And then you see the making of camera shots, especially in the old days, some crappy video camera, and it looks so different. And then. I just wanted to understand what's the difference. How do you get from this to that? So it's a fascination for me as a teenager, basically. And then I got a little bit more into, into f filmmaking and doing my own little stuff, a lot of stuff with green screen, actually, and compositing. And then when I was in high school, the DSLRs started, uh, came out and you could film on them. And so I got the cheapest one and shot some shorts with friends and yeah. I directed them myself, but then I figured out I actually, I don't want to become a director, I want to become a cinematographer. Mm. Yeah, because that's, uh, I, feel, I feel like everyone that I know at least definitely started out uh, thinking that film was a uh, possibility because of those DVD special features. I've mentioned it a million times on this yeah. podcast, how like I still like bulk by like a few days ago, I was just at the store and just bought a stat. It was like the sting actually the everything everywhere, uh, Blu-ray, the 4k <laughs> one, uh, the apocalypse now, like 4k six, six disc set. And like a few other things. And the guy at the store was like, wow, movie night, huh? And I was like, no, oh, I just collect them. Like, <laughs> I just want the special features. <laughs> I, I still love making offs and I try to get them. It's different, uh, difficult nowadays with uh, streaming 
and stuff. I also like to listen to DVD audio com- commentary. I've, so. I've mentioned that uh, so many times that I think, A, streamers should put, you know how you can choose what language you watch yeah, sure. stuff in. They should put the um, director commentary in that. Like, how, how big is a... Mm-hmm. MP3 I think, file, like I think 400 with, megabytes? With, uh, House of Cards, the first episode, I think, there's an audio commentar- commentary of Fincher, if I'm not mistaken. But it's really? the only time I ever got that on Netflix. So then <laughs> they know it's possible. I, Maybe I'm confused. I, I'm not sure, but I th- seem to remember. I got to check that out because I've been saying I've been screaming about that and I've been screaming about uh, <laughs> how we need to. I'm just screaming in general uh, how we need to. Um, make spe- like a special features all the dps agree that this is a good idea we need a special features streamer because i imagine those oh. aren't expensive to like the rights to those aren't expensive you know no no studio is like give us 40 billion dollars for the feature at <laughs> for uh the phantom yeah true you know <laughs> yeah um but uh one thing that i've mentioned a lot we'll, we'll probably skip around a lot in this podcast because i'm uh, slightly scattered ringed but um one thing that i've talked about a lot on this podcast is how film and well first of all we should for the people normally i never ask this because it sounds like i haven't done my research but this film is so niche that i think i will have to have uh you guys explain the film to the listeners so the it's about um a very let's say famous uh, i suppose magician who wrote a book. Um, Hans, can you kind of uh, uh, walk the audience through um, kind of what it is and, 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 and what the documentary is about? Yeah. Uh, so the background story is that uh, there is a book that's the so-called Bible of card magic for card magicians nowadays. And what it actually is, it's half... Um, um, an explanation how to cheat at cards and half it's an explanation how to perform magic tricks for friends and family, sort of. And um, this has become the Bible of card magic uh, because it was revolutionary at the time it was published. The way it was written, it was uh, written very eloquently and uh, uh, all the techniques summarized in this one uh, book, which is very technical. It was just an amazing a summary of everything, uh, all of the material that would out, uh, was out there at the time. And up until today, we don't know who wrote it. So this is something that fascinated me from the beginning because usually it's the magicians that control the secrets. And in this case, we have a secret that magicians can't control. Uh, so this is something I loved about this. And in this movie, we uh, conduct interviews with some of the best magicians that are currently on this planet. Uh, and we try to solve this mystery, sort of. We want to find who that author was of this famous book called The Expert of the Card Table. And the alias he used was S.W. Erdnase, hence the title of the movie, The Expert of the Card Table, Looking for Erdnase. Yeah, it's uh, it's a be- the film is a beautiful combination of just straight up regular ass documentary I shouldn't say regular, like it's not, you know, but it's like a, a regular documentary uh, sure. on top of these really uh, fantastically created um, uh, recreations of, of possibilities, I should say, not to give like, you know, too much of the film away, but um, it, it is halfway uh, a narrative, a traditional narrative film. And it, and it has the look of that. And, uh, you know, kind of jumping into the, cinematography side first i kind of wanted to know like how i can't imagine the budget for this was too big but it looks you know ju- just as uh high budget as any narrative film um you know with all the set pieces are great the uh design is great the lighting's fantastic i was wondering if you could walk me through like how um how you guys approach that any any ooh, any references maybe you had uh, especially you know I, I i recall i watched it like three weeks ago i guess um, but I recall like the prison scene was particularly pretty. Um, the apartment and like the little bakery all look just perfect. Well, well first of all, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and yeah, we had a really tiny budget. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not sure how much I can go into detail, but I can say it's less. it was less than 200K. So mm. 
Mm-hmm. Small. Uh, and it's for yeah. the documentary Pretty part small. and the uh, and, uh, uh, sort of feature narrative part. And we traveled to the States and shot our interviews there and stuff. So we always had the budget sort of in mind and thought, how can we make the best out of it? How many days can we have? What equipment is the right choice? And how can we make this look like a movie within the limits we have? Um, And I mean, the project started uh, 2017 and we shot the first scene sort of as a proof of concept in 2017 and it's actually a scene that's still in a movie um, oh really yeah yeah so uh, then we waited three you know, two years or two and a half years and shot uh, shot the rest of it and so the first scene when the illustrator and Ardenes meet that was shot three years before interesting um and yeah so that's that, uh I, I remember that scene being a slightly different and I was like, oh, interesting choice. That would make sense that it's just older. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We tried. Uh, we hope nobody would realize, but of course. So we sort of back then we sort of set the set the look kind of. I mean, we had some rules how I wanted the movie to to look. I would watch a lot of movies together and talked about uh, stuff. And basically I'd say we we went for more traditional traditional look so we said no handheld no no gimbal uh, and also a more tra- traditional way to light everything not really not old school hard light fresnel but traditional for today so i mean i grew up with movies in the 90s and 2000s so that's that's almost traditional today the way those no. were lit and we also wanted to go for a 16 millimeter uh, film look. So um, yeah. we uh, shot uh, the first scene. We also shot on 16 millimeter lenses that were uh, specifically th- designed for this. Um, and I think we were shooting on an, um, a red with an 8K sensor and then cropping. So we still would get a 4K image, but we would have like a 16 millimeter crop. Because, yeah, the, the look of the film, I. You know, any any camera nerd is always sitting there going like, I wonder what they shot on. <laughs> um, but that but they. Uh, the soup, the Super 16 kind of look, I was like, is it you know, I was thinking you guys shot it on like an older black magic because those older black magics look very filmy. Um, but so you're, it is you're what we like, ended up using for the rest uh, for the other scenes, the the uh, red we only used for the first one. But I think Mark can oh. tell you more about that. Yeah, but basically back in 2017, when we decided we want to go with a 16 millimeter, we had another company we worked together with. They had a red a helium and we just mm. used the 4K extraction. So it was rough, roughly 16 millimeter and we uh, got um, 60 millimeter Zeiss high speed primes um, and basically shot close to wide open. And they're quite soft and flare, interestingly. Um, and it was basically at the time where everybody was going full frame and large format, and we thought it would be fun to to go small <laughs> format instead. Um, and originally, two years later, uh, we still planned on using the same camera. We were still in cooperation with the same company. But I think two weeks before the first day of shooting, they sort of dropped out and we couldn't get the camera. Mm. And since it's a small budget film and my philosophy with indie and low budget stuff is basically always get the cheapest camera you can get but it's still quite good and then right. all the money you have for equipment use it for lighting and grip mm-hmm. um, so i actually decided to test my i had a pocket 4k myself so the, oh okay yeah. a newer one <laughs> and it's micro four third but if you use like 80% of the frame, it's roughly a 60 millimeter again. And this update to do this came out like two days before we wanted to start oh, shooting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the best time to start changing yeah. things around. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we had, uh, had a PL mount on the camera and used the, used the Zeiss uh, 
six millimeter high speeds we used on the first shoot. And actually they worked great together. I was, in hindsight, I was happy with the choice of the pocket. It was much easier to handle. We had, we had quite the sound problems on the first uh, yeah. time we shot with the red. At the Black Magic, you you put a small V mount on the camera and it runs half the day. Also, we yeah. had some um, color matching problems with the red because uh, when it heats up, obviously the sensor reacts differently to light and and the colors change. And uh, I remember that at some point we had to pause for ten minutes just because of the sound. Uh, um, it was making so it could cool down and then 10 minutes later we started shooting again and then in color correction Mark was like okay this looks like two different cameras this one is is magenta and the other one is green so yeah but I don't want to uh, hate on on red uh, make great cameras well, and, uh, <laughs> uh, they're great cameras but I've I personally have hated almost every red I've ever used especially as an AC it's fucking miserable I just uh, borrowed um, the parent company of the people who put this podcast out as film tools. They're like a local camera store, uh, camera equipment store. And um, they let me borrow their Raptor for mm -hmm. a week to, for a review. Um, and a few things I love about that. I, I think that's probably their best camera so far. I know a friend of mine who's been a red owner his whole life slightly disagrees, but um, they actually put a, a thermoelectric coupler on the sensor. Mm -hmm. So now you don't, that temperature shift doesn't affect oh. the sensor anymore. That's smart. They fixed it. They fucking okay. fixed it. <laughs> That's good. It's good to know. Yeah. The, the fan's not loud. The, yeah, they, they, they took care of all that. You don't have to black shade for a half hour. That's another really no. great thing. About <laughs> yeah. One. I did sure this that. once. I did this once, basically 10 minutes before we wanted to shoot. Let's do a Oops. black shading. Yeah. You only do that once. <laughs> So I shot something <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the I shot something on the Komodo a couple of weeks ago and really enjoyed the camera. So yeah, the the Komodo I've is a great camera. I wasn't as as thrilled with it, you know, because it's it's there's so many things about it that are stripped away to make it yeah what it is. But I think the Raptor, which on, oops, uh, the Raptor is only slightly bigger and uh, has like all the ports you need and all the features you'd like. And then the XL obviously has built in NDs, which I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how red and black magic for that matter have decided, mm -hmm. uh, NDs are going to be the last thing they think about. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> Every other camera manufacturer Agreed. was like, yeah, people use them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, talking about, uh, your lighting package, was there a sort of, um, there, there's a remarkably consistent look except for the one, <laughs> Before we get into the lighting package, mm -hmm. is there any reason why there's only one time period that's in black and white and then the rest of them are in color? <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, because all these uh, reenactment scenes or the, all those period pieces take place around 1900, right? And they all show a different candidate, a different person that Erdnays might have been. Um, and then we have this one black and white um scene that's sort of intercut with also another period piece. And this is sort of in between the different time levels we have, because we have today with the modern day uh, B-roll and the interviews, and then we have those period pieces. And in between, there was this uh, journalist in the 1950s uh, who first came up with the uh, question, who is Erdnes, and seriously investigated it. So I want to make clear that this is not a flashback of who Erdnes might have been, but it is another level of the research. So I see. we wanted to go for this film noir kind of look because it also fit a little bit time-wise. So we wanted to have this film noir kind of look for this uh, one scene that was neither here nor there. Got it. Yeah, because I had I got a whole lick of notes here. Before I, before I knew I was going to interview you guys, I wrote down all these notes, hoping I would be able to interview <laughs> oh, you. So great. yeah, at the top, wow. it's like black and white. And then, and then it's like, why color? Why is this in color? Wait, it's, it's 50 <laughs> years before that. Why is that in color? Yeah. yeah. 18, 1897 is in color. What happened? <laughs> actually, actually one, one more thing about that to be completely honest with you. I mean, when you shoot a movie on such a budget, uh, basically after our main shooting block, we had almost no money left 
and we hadn't shot those scenes and we know we needed we needed the film was in the edit already and we need really realized okay we really need those scenes to connect everything we had only very little budget left and black and white makes things easier it makes things look nice and too it's, especially yeah. for production design so we yeah. shot that <laughs> we shot the scene at the basement of our production company um <laughs> and, and we decided okay we we need to do certain things to make it still look interesting with the limited budget so we decided let's go with black and, white. black and white but anamorphic <laughs> Yeah, and I, <laughs> I have an I have an old anamorphic projector lens. That's oh, kind nice. of clunky the, and difficult to use. And now it's a it's a Zancor, Zancor. I don't oh, know how to pronounce okay. it. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, and it's very interesting, but it's also difficult to handle and makes crazy flares and it's tough to focus. But we know it's basically just shot reverse shot of two people talking on a phone. So maybe we can make it work and it helps sort of to, to not, I mean, it, it makes an, it's another layer on the look. So we don't actually realize uh, that we are in the basement of our production company and we couldn't also afford the 60 millimeter lenses. So we thought, okay, let's go with a completely different way because we mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to get the same look that we got on the other. Yeah, it it definitely oh, doesn't look, uh, and I mean, it obviously looks different because it's like a different setup and everything. But it do, it doesn't look like you ran out of money. <laughs> it still looks that one still looks good. Good, it's very good. good. <laughs> Honestly, like guys, the the uh, I don't want to uh, blow too much smoke at you, but like it it all of the um, all of the I mean all the whole film, but especially all the narrative stuff or the the recreations all look just fantastic. Like it, anyone can. Uh, I think any student or anyone who who's uh, been working in, in film forever, both can learn some really nice little. Again, that prison scene is like a classic, <laughs> as you were saying, like um, um, kind of fundamental filmmaking and uh, is just very elegantly uh, design, uh, designed lighting wise. Um, it just looks fantastic. And especially on a pocket fork, you know, so many people talk about uh, black magic. You know, on one hand, you've got fanatic black magic fans. On the other <laughs> hand, you're like, oh, they're cheap or whatever but you can get really amazing results with them yeah yeah I absolutely agree first of all thank you thank you again and i'm always it's always interesting how how long cinematographers can talk about what camera they prefer yeah. and I, me too by the way i can talk hours just about the camera but in the end it's probably if you do it right if you expose right it's only the last two three percent most people won't notice but if you've got a, especially on a low budget, if you've got a light more, if you've got a dolly, that makes a huge difference, I think. So that's why my philosophy always was, I take the camera I can basically afford and I'm, I'm not using the pockets so much anymore, but it's a great com camera for basically a thousand bucks. That's yeah. Yeah. And you get time um, code, which is which is nice if you do a real movie shoot with sound. Okay, so basically get all the professional features. It's great. Yeah, I uh, jump back to my question from like an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> what uh, what kind of lighting package were you traveling with? Was it the same uh, for every s scene? Like, were you just kind of repurposing the same lights, or were you more tailoring them to each uh, scene? We basically had the same package for all the scenes except the train. Mm. Uh, the train was uh, was a different beast. So yeah, because yeah. that's a that's a relatively large set, isn't it? Like lengthwise. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We had um, every uh, how do you say it? Uh, car, right? The individual yep. uh, compartments are cars, right? And it's not confusing at all, but okay. <laughs> <I know>. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, every uh, car of the train was a different department. So in the back, we had uh, the actors and costume design and all of that. Uh, then there was a little bit production de uh, design. Then there was production and catering next to one another. Surprise. Um, oh, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then there was the actual set. So every time an actor was getting ready, 
um, they basically had to walk for five minutes in this one direction until <laughs> they ended up on set. And it was so cold. It was freezing. I think it was November. Uh, yeah. And of course, you can't heat up the entire train and then shoot and get good audio. So we would uh, have the heating on. And then when we were rolling, we would turn it off. And it was so small because we didn't build it as a set. We actually went into a real train uh, from that time period and tried to shoot there. And so it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was a nightmare. I was definitely on worse shoots. Actually, it was a lot of fun, but it was yeah. complicated. This is what I'm going to say. So, But I enjoyed those scenes very much. It was great, I think. They're very, pr I mean, I've said this a million times on this podcast too, and I've been able to, lucky enough to uh, interview some really amazing production designers, but DPs get a lot of credit for what production designers actually did. Absolutely. Yeah. And that train is, that train is definitely beautiful because the train's beautiful, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So maybe that's a good time to mention Anna Luisa Fiecke, who was our production yeah. designer and who's been uh, with us and involved uh, in the project from the beginning, working for free for like two years, helping me to get the proof of concept scene and to get the project started. So um, if you're ever listening, Anna, thank you very much yeah. for helping me realize <laughs> this film. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great shout out. Yeah, she's not. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> Often, oftentimes, actually, when people say, oh, that's, that's great cinematography, sometimes they really mean it's great production design because what, what's in front of the camera matters so much. It was really nice to shoot in all those really nice locations from that time period. And most of them were actually built by, by Anna. Uh, really? Or, or modified yeah. so, so far that they, are, they work for us. But uh, the apartment in uh, San Francisco and the bakery was all built by her. If you're interested, yes. I'm going to send you some behind the scenes photos and stuff like this. Oh, uh, yes. So then, then you can actually see how we set everything up. Uh, for example, the uh, um, San Francisco apartment the bakery and the newspaper office. It's actually one apartment. And you were able to walk from one room to the other, and you would be in uh, in a different in a different setting entirely. Um, this was pretty cool. Um, so, and and we basically had this old apartment building, this old flat, and I built everything from scratch. And one of the more trickier parts was to make a German apartment look like America, especially in around 1900. Uh, and what, what, what Anna was complaining about all the time were the windows. She was like, no, we can't shoot here because the windows are so different. No window in America looks like this. <laughs> and she ended up building something in front of every window and then putting a different window. I wasn't seeing the difference really, to be honest. And there was a different <laughs> window in front of the actual window. And then it was, of, and then it was okay. Then it was fine. So, <laughs> yeah. It's, you yeah. know, that's, that's why you, uh, keep those people uh, close to you because yeah, <laughs> the, the little, the little life or detail that some of us would never uh, pay attention to is okay. often very important. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say I'm from the San Francisco Bay area and uh, she nailed it. That's like, ah. that's what I remember. Uh, obviously I didn't live in the 19, the early 1900s, <laughs> but uh Technically, I was born in the late 1900s, uh, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's like what they that that's what it, that's what they told us it looked like. Like it, you can go to like various ghost towns up there and like they have obviously like recreations of stuff. And that's all very uh, what I remember it being. It honestly, uh, uh, another compliment to you guys. The only thing that reminded me y'all were German was just people's like accents, people like doing American <laughs> accents, because I've, I've worked with a lot of Germans before uh, on various like commercials and stuff. And uh, sometimes to make fun of me, they'll do an American accent. And I'm like, and I can just hear like at random <laughs> syllables. I'm like, oh, I got you, motherfucker. You're <laughs> like, <laughs> OK, apart, going, from like, oh, main, apart from the main apart from the main actor, do you remember uh, where you heard it? Uh, it is the, it is the main actor and no, I don't remember. It's just, it, it, I'm telling you, it's like random syllables. You'll just hear, uh, slightly off if you've listened to Germans enough. Like it's just, 
it's not obviously it's not obvious i don't know if anyone would pick up on it it's like a weird little memory i have from uh yeah my friends over at hollow ride if they ever listen to this um mm-hmm. they're all german yeah now i was i was casting uh florian um because he's also a magician and uh, he's a professional actor and we knew each other from ages ago because he was joining the magic circle here in germany when i was uh, oh, wow. joining and he was actually a part of my very very first short film i ever shot um and i'm never going to show anyone um <laughs> So he was part of this, and then he was also part of this, my, my, my first feature now, um, which I think is also very, very nice of him to go through all of these various steps with me. And uh, he obviously is not a native. So um, I was like, okay, maybe that's still possible because I want to work with him. I like his acting, um, and I, uh, we, we knew each other from uh, forever ago. But then I would definitely need to cast everyone else to be a native, if possible. So it's not an English movie and everybody speaks English with a German accent. This would be horrible. Right. Uh, so I try <laughs> to do this as as good as good as possible, as well as possible. Yeah, now we're I think, yeah. <laughs> I think good's the right one there. I don't, I don't know if it yeah. matters. And um, I think we got a lot of natives not 100 but uh, a lot of people who spoke very good uh, english and also florian we uh, organized a dialect coach he could work with um and i always had this argument well we don't know who Erdnays was so maybe he was a german immigrant you don't know that so 100 percent. Yeah. the 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 bay area um is a story of immigrants like that's the that's what made the uh entire there's this great documentary i've mentioned a bunch of times on this podcast called um fog city mavericks and it's about all the filmmakers who went to the bay area left los angeles went to the bay area uh to make film and you were talking like george lucas coppola um clint eastwood uh all the all these people and um it's the story of that area every single time it's where people go to get away from maybe not anymore now it's the tech sector of the world but historically it's where everyone went to go um be different and try something new and uh i i I truly do want to make i just wrote down um an idea the other night there are so many amazing musicians that came out of the bay area that i that i want to make a fog city mavericks for (laughs) musicians you know you got sheila e prince's drummer um you know deftones uh Tupac, you know, so many, like, so many different, uh, anyway, that's, I'm going to need your help making that documentary. Thank you for agreeing <laughs> to pay for it. Um, uh, but, uh, I did want to, I did want to go back and touch on the lighting package. What was yeah. that package? Cause you did such a good job of you. If it was the same, like you're saying, it was the same package the whole time. You did such a good job of making every scene, um, fully fleshed out. There wasn't, there wasn't like, oh, if only we had, it didn't seem like there was like, oh, if only we had another fixture or something so can you walk me through like what that package was and generally how you were uh the idea behind lighting each uh setup sure so i really like led lights and use them a lot i started during film school to build my own led lights i i built a four by four frame basically full of leds or flexible fabric now they're more common. Back then when I did, nobody here in Germany at least used them. Um, and I love that light. It's great. Um, but I thought it would be interesting for the period setting to also go with a more traditional lighting package and actually avoid using LEDs. <clears throat> mm. So I ended up using them on a, in a couple of uh, moments because I, I own some and they were available. But basically we had about six lights where one wow. where one 4k hmi um uh re sun so you can change to the 2.5k um, um bulb and luckily in europe you can plug a 2.5k right. in every <laughs> um household uh, socket you can't do that in the us and 2.5k yeah. LEDs actually... changed filmmaking for <laughs> LA uh, for uh, American <laughs> students. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then I have a 
I have a little Dado uh, 400 watt HMI with a projector lens. I love the I love the projector lenses. Nowadays yeah. you have them on the on the aperture lights, for example, and also a source for tungsten. And I, especially when you can't really light so much from outside because the rigging would be too, or you're up in the uh, third floor or something, um, then you can just maybe rig a, a white card over the window and then you bounce the projector light in there. So I, I like to do that. Um, I love mirrors. We had a, a, a one by one meter, so roughly a three by three uh, feet mirror and especially simulating sunlight I think it's always helps you if you get the highest tripod you can get put the mirror on top get it as high as possible put the light on the ground the strongest you can get into the mirror back through the window you got a nice crisp really sun like looking mm -hmm. uh, looking uh, light without using condor lifts and cherry pickers and stuff because we had none of those. Right. Um, and then I had a couple of tungsten softboxes, reefer lights. And basically, that's my lighting package, except for the train. For the train, we needed three 4K HMIs because I wanted to have... And you build a wagon where you could put yeah. the lights on <laughs> and drive by the window. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were yeah. shooting on real train tracks. So there was was a train track to the left of the train and to the right of the train. So we had a little wagon on the train tracks and we put one light in there. You don't really see it so much in the movie, just uh, when they're playing cards and you look really mm. closely, the light's moving. But for the big scene and the in, in uh, we couldn't we couldn't move all three lights at the same time. Um, but yeah, we had three 4K. HMIs uh, and a lot of butterflies uh, and stuff. I also believe that you can do so much with just flags and uh, floppies and uh, especially just using black to just negative fill can work wonders. Yeah, yeah especially so. these days uh, with digital sen sensors being so sensitive. Uh, so many DPs have talked about how it's more about taking away light than it is adding. Whereas back in the days of shooting film, you had to punch sure. things with light. Sure. Yeah. So, for example, the scene in the um, in the prison, we basically had the had one uh, 4K coming through the little window, bouncing off the floor, and then, of course, we for the closer shots, we added some lights to. But uh, I think muslin laying on the floor and sort of wrapped around the soft bounce from the floor a little bit. But that's it. Yeah, that uh, I think I've mentioned it a little earlier, but that is that's my favorite setup. The train and that and that prison <laughs> scene are like my two favorite setups by far. I thought the train was green screen like and I don't mean that as a, as a negative. I mean, I it was it looked so controlled that I thought that was on a on a stage. Yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of discussions about the train because it was the most complicated scene we had to shoot and to fit it in our budget was the most complicated too. And we obviously knew we couldn't uh, get the crew to, I don't know, the south of Spain or something that would remotely look like the desert mm. and shoot in an actual moving train. We could never afford that. So we were shooting the documentary parts in... August and we would mm -hmm. shoot the na narrative parts in I think November. So when we were in the States, we were in Los Angeles and had to go to Las Vegas. So we took a car and drove to the Death Valley. So it's and, a long drive. And filmed filmed our plates there. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. great because first of all, we could control uh, exposure and time of day and stuff. And also I knew beforehand when shooting the scene, what will actually be projected in the windows, because oftentimes you shoot something in front of green screen or whatever, and you don't, if you don't actually know what's going to be in there, it'll always be tough to match. Yeah. And yeah. then we, we had different ideas how to shoot it. And I really pushed for 
using white instead of instead of green because yeah. because i knew basically i i did it once for a short film R roger deakins actually does it a lot and fincher does it a lot too and helps so much uh, because you don't have any spill and actually the white uh, fabric outside helps you light the scene and you get a similar looking light uh, they would actually get from from sky or just bright outside. If we had green screen all around, I would have needed a much much bigger lighting package to get some white light basically in the in the. Get rid rid of the spill. Yeah, and get rid of the spill. So we shot not in the studio but outside, and we angled the uh, uh, the white butterflies like in a thirty degree angle. So we would actually bounce some skylight in the white fabric and back into um, our train. And then we added the HMI as, as hard, hard sunlight. And it worked great. And actually, I think the I had a lot of discussions beforehand with the post-production people because they like green screen because they know, OK, right. I know how to do it and it's going to be fine. But in the end, they were very happy with it because if the window will anyway be quite overexposed if it should look realistic so going from complete white to overexposed desert it's not such a big difference so you can get away even with hair and glasses and stuff in front so I'm, well and exactly what you're saying like the, if you look at my window that's yeah. real right that's not yeah. green that's what nate the, i think that was what they did on on mank it was just they were on a mm -hmm. stage and then uh the outside of, of Manx's like little apartment or whatever, where he was all laid up with his foot yeah. up. Uh, it's just a white, it's just a white screen. And they were like, why'd you do that? And he's like, who hell, who cares what's outside? Mm -hmm. No one's looking out this window going, oh, the dynamic range sucks. Like it's, <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's just white. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you go too far with a green screen and you want to see everything outside, you'll end up looking unrealistic and it's yeah. fake. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy we did it with a white screen instead of uh, green screen. And, and we, had, uh, we had two scenes, two lighting setups, one later uh, during uh, a dusk. And uh, then we basically just bounced our HMIs into, into our white butterflies and played a little bit with different colors. So we get a sort of uh, transition from very cold blue skylight to warmer sunset and yeah i think the, the the darker scene also worked worked well with the uh with the uh white screen setup absolutely um were there any uh sort of film references that you guys uh took from uh that that uh informed this film or were you just kind of going from your own uh, imagination, visually or from a, a uh, structural visually, yeah. point of view, visually, yeah, um, or structure. I mean, both. If if <laughs> if you've got both, well, well, in terms of structure, um, searching for Sugar Man uh, was an inspiration, definitely. Hmm. And um, there is a film called The Imposter, which also has this very unique approach of combining documentary and uh, uh, narrative filmmaking. So this is from a, a structural point of view. And I think what I, uh, I think I want to go for a Robert Richardson kind of uh, look, but not too artificial. Uh, so not uh, co a completely white uh, rim light and stuff like this. Right. Um, <laughs> or the giant light that hits the table in all of his movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is sort of what I wanted, but more subtle. Um, I remember sitting in the cinema for, for Hateful Eight, uh, and they, they cut to a, a white shot of uh, these uh, huts and... Uh, so on and i could just see that behind the hut and behind every i don't know hill of snow there would just be a huge light illuminating everything <laughs> and i laughed and it looked amazing it was a very very beautiful frame but i laughed because this is not what, what moonlight looks like and the entire cinema was silent because it was <laughs> just a, a, not a funny scene <laughs> so right. it was oh. weird, but <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, he. I would say his lighting is a lot more uh, impressionistic. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a lot. It's funny, you know that that actually does bring up a good point. Like you can get away with a lot in film. You can do things like I think. I think as filmmakers, we can kind of get caught up in like, oh, it doesn't look perfect, and it's like you can get away with quite a bit. People, the audience will forgive a uh, moon that comes from the floor and lights trees. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like at night, yeah. you see that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> In Thelma and Louise, you can also see it when they, in the end of the movie, when they drive through the valley in the desert, and you can also see that the moon is actually down there in the valley, uh, trying to, to light the, the valley itself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what were the, what were the, uh, the sort of, um, so it was mostly, so it was less so like films that you were referencing visually and more just kind of uh, styles. What's that? Yeah, I think uh, Mark also uh, a huge role model for you is Deacons, as far as I know. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are, there are quite a lot of cinematographers who had a great influence on me, but I, I, we didn't reference uh, Deacons, I would say, in, in any specific way in this movie. I think, I mean, we talked about... Uh, Leon the Professional is a great is mm. something that influences you a lot, and I think it influenced a lot of the shots actually also. Yeah, uh, mainly the apartment in San Francisco. Yeah. I wanted the yeah. apartment in San Francisco to be lit very similar to like the, the opening massacre sort of in the end. Yeah, and we talked sure. a lot about different westerns. Yeah. Um, so that's also something influenced. I wouldn't say there's a specific movie that sort of we we looked at and thought oh we want basically want our movie to look like this it's a it's a combination of a lot of things and yeah we wanted to go a little little bit more let's say impressionist impressionistic um without being too obvious but it, i wouldn't say we try to be naturalistic sure yeah no it's it's, it's uh like you said earlier it's it's a very classic um uh style that that is that is uh immediately the, obvious that it's cinematic you know i think the main difference uh, also uh, uh visually for uh, for me was to uh, distinguish the documentary parts from the reenactment scene so you can see uh, really see a difference there this is why we also switch aspect ratios um mm. And uh, this is also why we went for a more digital look for the for the interview. So it looks more modern. We also use different lenses to get a crisper look for the interviews. And then we had this uh, softer and um, less natural, uh, more impressionistic style for the reenactment scenes. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, uh, what was I going to say about the interviews? The interviews are great. Um, what was oh. <laughs> It was, you know, it was actually just a random thing. When you go and interview Richard Turner, for those people listening, Richard Turner is one of the best card mechanics of all time. Uh, that quick shot of his closet, I really appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, what, 500 decks of cards just stacked More. in there? Well, it's, it's a couple of thousands, and, and he's uh, like the official tester uh, for, for B cards. So um, he do, does uh, sort of like quality control. I, th I think for USPCC in general, he tests a lot of the decks from them. Interesting. Um, I do want to get into cards because you guys made your own cards and I bought a brick, but they're stuck in New York. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> that's not your fault. That's clearly our fault. Um, but uh, they made it from Germany. Now they're just stuck on the wrong coast. But uh, I did uh, quickly want to touch on the color grade for all of the... Um, mm. Uh, reenactments do you guys sure. were, were you very in, obviously you're probably very involved in that but um oh wait uh mark you did it right yeah so <laughs> yeah okay i was about to say were you I, talking I to your colorist you're the colorist yeah uh that's perfect so can you walk me through kind of your uh system there for color grading and kind of uh, how you approach that yeah sure so we always knew we wanted to go for a more traditional film film look including some sort of film emulation for the uh, for the fi na narrative parts, and I've been testing for. I'm always fascinated by by analog film stock film stocks, and as I said, I, growing up in the '90s and uh, 2000s, sort of this era of 
film film look. So basically, Vision th Vision Two, Vision Three, and yeah. uh, sort of classic print film look. That's and lit in a sort of traditional film way with your t typical lighting ratios and stuff. That's sort of my my reference point because if you say film look, it can mean a thousand different ways, especially depending when you grow when you have grown up and uh, uh, photography is very different than motion yeah. and the way you scan it or project it uh, uh, there is not one film look so that's basically my reference point and steve yedlin of course sort of changed a lot for me i've name dropped um, him a million times on this <laughs> podcast <laughs> yeah i mean he's he's amazing and i so appreciate what what he what he does um and basically opened my eyes that it was possible to match digital and film to a point where almost nobody, I say, would see the difference. So or I care. read, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, so, get, you get close enough, and the audience goes, "Oh yeah, that's film." <laughs> right. So I I spent a lot of time reading everything I could about this shooting films, different film stocks, scanning them, looking at them and sort of develop my own process, um, inspired by, by Stephen Yetlin. Um, and essentially, my current form of this is I shoot color charts with a couple of thousand patches, actually in an enclosure, so the lighting is always the same and you have to make sure you do a different profile for daylight tungsten. Basically, the moment you change a little bit, in the lighting, it won't match perfectly, but it gets you close enough. Mm. And I figured out my first test were just with a regular color checker and it looked horrible. Not yep. even close. Yep. Then I got the bigger color checker with 200, I know, I know, 88 patches. Still way off. I wasn't happy at all. So I, I tried many, many things and sort of used the part of the pandemic to to work on that and fine tune it and try different algorithms and the matching uh, later in post and the right, right, soft, right software is still something I'm working on. But in the end, the, basically, the, I, yeah. The color checkers, you you basically prepared your, yourself to um, to do your color science project. How many patches are on there now? Do you, do you know? Um, I think there are uh, I think a couple of hundreds and I do different exposures also. So I end up with roughly uh, two and a half K patches mm -hmm. and I'm happy with that. Yeah, it's I I'm so glad to hear you say that because I did that over the pandemic, too. Oh, great. <laughs> and I'm just glad to hear there's someone else who's insane enough to just sit there in resolve and just be micro adjusting versus yeah. curves and. <laughs> Who am I talking to? What 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 is happening? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's strange when you realize it's I don't know you are at home on the weekend and it's I don't know uh, one a.m. and you're still matching color stuff. Well, yeah. Well, and the thing that sucked for me was I only have the original color. I just did this with the Raptor. I made a, I made a LUT for this uh, C five hundred that matches the Raptor about mm -hmm. ninety percent, but because I don't have a ton of color chips. What I would do is I'd match the color chart like exactly. And then I would just go around filming random stuff and then hmm. would just have to eyeball it. And I've okay, been doing yeah. that for I a while. See. And it's, you know, close enough for government work, but it's not it's not like perfect. Yeah. And, it, and that annoys me. <laughs> I think you're quite limited uh, in resolve to yeah. do, do these basically three dimensional changes because you got you versus saturation or luminance for the situation. So basically two dimensional things you can change. But if you want to say, okay, only very saturated orange reds that are dark, I only want to affect that, that you sort of get to the limits of resolve and need, need different things. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, but it's, and it's, it, it's a journey for me and it's, but I think it's fun and I'm happy with the results and I'm getting better and better. And I had a very, very early version of 
of all that before we shot and made a LUT and put it in the camera. And I think that's quite important that you have a LUT that at least gives you a saturation and contrast roughly to what you're shooting because the regular Rec. 709 LUTs are so low contrast in comparison to... Yeah, agreed. <laughs> They're all terrible. Uh, I don't like them too. Um, yeah. But they're, uh, if you just light and exposed based on that, you will never use enough fill light and don't go to sort of, cla I think part of the film look is also the way, or may maybe a huge part of the, f the film look, if you want to call it, is actually the way you have to be prepared if you shoot on actual film and you don't have a monitor and see it. Mm. So I'm still, I still like to use my light meter and I like to think, test a couple of things and get some specific lighting ratios key to fill in my head and try to not look at the camera until I think it's right. And then just, I mean, it's not, I'm happy that I can look at the camera and check. I don't right. use it to expose, but basically to get the lighting I want it, I want and the fill level I want and get consistency there. I think it's actually a very big part of the look. Um, and if you just use your regular Rec. 709 LUT and shoot and it looks okay, if you go to the film emulation afterwards, it might look horrible. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. I uh, I'm still a meter person myself. Getting a color meter too was like saved mm -hmm. my life, especially with the uh, LEDs where you can just put in the XY coordinates. So yeah. Just meter the sun, XY coordinate. Ah, oh, everything looks great. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's the last because now everyone has the monitor. So as a DP, you're not like a wizard anymore. You don't like <laughs> no. Trust me, it'll look great. But if you if the camera's turned off and you start figuring out your ratios yeah. with the meter, and then they just turn it on and it looks great, you're you're the wizard again. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's good. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy um, that that I can just tell my my assistant where to put the, or my my grip to where to put the camera and can start lighting and get everything ready and then check. I think uh, still think that's for for me personally the. The better saves work time, definitely. Yeah, it can and battery. <laughs> if you're if you're shooting on batteries and you and you don't have to turn the camera on to like expose for yeah. thirty minutes, forty five minutes, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's uh, definitely a great thing. I wanted to talk about um, the magic stuff because I or I shouldn't say all the magic stuff, but uh, I've said a million times on this podcast how I think uh, magic and music, but uh, magic and f cinema. Um, are kind of the same thing uh, as art forms. And um, I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. For me, it's, it's, you have some great quotes uh, in the film, you know, they're, they're uh, was it Richard Linkletter? I know it was Ethan Hawke was explaining to Stephen Colbert. He was like, a good movie isn't, doesn't happen in the theater. It happens when you leave the theater. And you've got a great quote in the film where the answer isn't as fun as the question. That's what a mystery uh, that's effect. what mystery is really about. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think those things are so intrinsically linked and I was wondering if you guys had any, had any other thoughts about how magic and cinema are related, not, not only, uh, uh, as a concept, but in the film, I believe you mentioned the guy who invented film was a magician. Well, I think there are very uh, different levels how they are uh, similar. For example, the way how I want to back uh, backwards uh, engineer how a magic trick is done is very similar to how I would think about, okay, how they light this scene or how uh, did they stage this scene? And then I also have to go back in sort of similar uh, thinking pattern in order to analyze how did they shoot the scene is, is very very similar to, uh, the, compared to how is this trick done. So this is uh, one level, I would say. And uh, then there's also this storytelling level, the way if you want to structure a trick well, you can also, for example, have three phases, just like you have maybe three different um, acts to, to a movie plot. Um, so... Um, they are sort of similar as well. Uh, and uh, regarding this, we also have a nice quote in the, in the movie. I think it's, it's Jason England uh, who says, um, 
uh, to him, magic is sort of like, or the, the mystery is sort of like um, the ending of a movie or the ending of a book. Um, making the point that um, if you already know, if you know how a trick is done, or if you know how a movie is going to end, mm -hmm. then you're taking the fun out of it. And this is also something that's similar, I think. And then, of course, you have the actual movie magic um, and all the tricks you can you can do. I'm not necessarily talking about VFX and CGI, but you can do so many uh, practical uh, film effects. And this is basically exactly what magic is, especially stage magic. Stage magic is practical film effects. That's it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just I was looking. I do secrets are like the ending of a good movie. I had that thing. The other one, uh, the other quote I really loved was um, talking about the importance of secrets. How uh, what is it? One of the reasons secrets are so important in magic is because the secret is what enables someone to uh, put this idea of impossibility into your brain for a moment. Yeah, and and that's kind of what film is. You know, we we were at the beginning talking so much about. Uh, special features and, and being fascinated by knowing how a film was made. And it's funny how as magicians, we would never have special features. I mean, you can buy a, you know, a book <laughs> or a magic DVD or whatever, but it, it's funny how those two art forms are um, the way that you go about. Oh, well, I suppose there's plenty of filmmakers who don't want to share, you know, how they lit something or how something was made. There's, there's a lot more secrecy. Uh, especially if the technique is new, then I think people are more secretive. I mean, if you want to reveal a classic magic trick, how to, I don't know, do a, a classic shift, nobody's gonna, uh, I don't know, hate on you for sharing this. But if someone releases something more or less really revolutionary that changes sort of the way we handle coins or cards or whatever, and um, this person's not gonna want uh, this effect or this technique being shared. And Obviously, it's not quite as bad if secrets are exposed in, in film in terms of how they did that. Um, exposing secrets like uh, which movie is coming out next or how it's going to end, then people get angry as well. So, <laughs> right. yeah, I think the, this uh, is... Uh, one thing that, that I noticed about, or I, I just know about, I, I, I uh, am privileged enough to film... Uh, a few magicians at the Magic Castle every so often. Um, oh, wow. That's so cool. Congratulations. Yeah. Dude, it's the best because I just get <laughs> to go for free, get to eat for free, drink for free, and hang out with the best magicians in the world. Um, but uh, the camera is, the camera does not lie, right? The camera sees everything. The camera's the worst observer. The camera's just burning your hands without blinking. And so I was wondering if, uh, you know, there's a few instances in the in the documentary where, like I saw Babel, I saw Babel for a quarter second. And I see him do like <laughs> I, like some card catch. It's like what the fuck? How? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, just perfection on that man. But um, where did you have to talk to any of these magicians? Like, were there like multiple takes, or, there, or were they just like this is the one <laughs> trick, and I'm never doing this thing again? Okay, Mark, do you want to yeah. take this one? Or? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good good question for me. So I'm not a magician, and I basically didn't know much about magic at all before I started. Uh, to work on this movie with Hanyu together. Um, and it was a learning curve for me because Hanyu gets very specific how to film those card performances and which angle works and which doesn't. And of course, it sort of sometimes it's counterintuitive to the way I would like to look at like to look at it visually or the way to light it. Um, if it's more documentary, they, they, maybe you see, okay, that's a great way the light looks on the hands, but no, you can't, it's, it's forbidden. You can't, uh, you can't look from this perspective it's, and you, I have forbidden. to go, I have to go a little <laughs> bit higher or a little bit lower to the right, left to the right. So basically Hanyo had to micromanage me and where to put the camera. And then it's quite strange when you, when somebody performs something for you and to my unknowing eye, it looks perfect. But no, it's terrible. We have to do it again. And we did, I don't know, we'd, on some of those uh, performances, we did like 40 takes or something. Yeah. And I didn't wow. see the difference. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, it's quite strange when you stand there and you obviously there must be a difference because I, I trust Hanyu and I know he wouldn't just do it for fun. 
but you don't I, I didn't I didn't see it but I get better I have to say I'm, I'm I understand much more about it I, I know more about it and I sort of mm. understand a little bit more how how most of the tricks work not actually work but what's the principle a little bit behind many of them um, and I know a little bit more how to sh how to shoot it now I wouldn't be comfortable shooting a magic without somebody like Hanyu around I have to uh, sure. still admit it's it's very special. It's very, yeah, you have to be really into, into it and know what you're doing. Um, but, but you know, that a lot I'm of a, repetitions. You so. know that I'm a perfectionist uh, in, in many ways and uh, a lot of times for, for the wrong reasons or uh, in, in places where it's really not, not important. But I think when it comes to magic and this repetitive nature of practicing until it's really, the move is really invisible from most angles and knowing your angles. And this is something that really stuck with me and which really made magic so fun for me to practice because this is something where I could actually do this and it would make sense to be, um, uh, to pay attention to to details so much. Um, and I think this is also why when I was the hand double for some of the slides, um, those I think were the worst days for Mark because <laughs> I was like, no, not again, not again. I don't like how my hands look. No, <laughs> I can see my pinky flash. And yeah. So it's a, is there any um, kind of things that you can directly say you've taken from magic into filmmaking? Any I guess I can't say techniques, but anything that you kind of see um, being the same, obviously perfectionism might be one of them, but kind of any similarities there? Something I would need to think about, honestly. The, the, the biggest thing is what I already mentioned. The way I would reconstruct a, a trick uh, helped me so much when I look at a frame and I want to um, reconstruct how they lit or how they reenacted um, this, this scene, this is the biggest thing for me that I took away from it. Definitely. Totally. Yeah. And the other, the other thing you mentioned about, uh, storytelling is like always being, you lo I love a film where the, the, you know, the movie's one, one step ahead of you. And that's just such classic yeah. magic, you know, telling, saying one thing and having, having done another. Um, I think, uh, one more thing, but it's, it's a tiny thing, uh, in terms of short films, um, Usually not all the time, but I would argue that in a short film, you don't have the time to actually build a three act structure. Right. Obviously there are exceptions, but in general, um, a short film for me should more be constructed like a joke. So you have a build up and then in the end you have your, um, the, the, the big moment, the punchline, then maybe 10 more seconds and then the, the short is over. And, you have a lot of magic effects like this as well. And you can still build it up like like, like um, you're walking up uh, stairs and then there's a next level of impossibility. And then you say, okay, but I can also do this blindfolded. And then you have the next level of impossibility, but you're building it, it up un until the, the end and the finale. And this is very similar to how I would structure a short film. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually um, fantastic advice. You know, it's uh, un oh, I was just looking down the the um the other quote I really loved was right at the end. He's like, "We're not protecting the secrets of magic from you. We're protecting you from the secrets." <laughs> yeah, and I and I think that's something that most audience members don't get. Um, I you know I I uh you know um Michael Amar obviously um. Mark, I don't know if you know uh, Mike Lamar, but I was able to, one thing that stuck with me, I learned this from one of his VHS tapes back in the day, which was whenever someone would be like, oh, uh, how'd you do that? You uh, you go, can you keep a secret? And then, yeah. And you go, so can I. And that was like the classic, that was the classic get fucked that you would uh, <laughs> tell every uh, audience member. But it does, it does leave them with a little bit of sense of um, specialness. I also hope that uh, this movie, because it's, I mean, yes, it is obviously for, for, for a very niche market in the first place, but I specifically designed it uh, so also laymen uh, would watch it and could enjoy watching it and learn about uh, magic as an art form. And I hope that after watching the movie, um, those people who've watched it will 
better understand how to enjoy a magic show, sort of. Because there are people that even get angry because they or they don't understand or they get sad because they think they're stupid or something like this. Um, you could argue that then maybe the magic wasn't performed correctly if this is how you leave the people. But that's this is not 100% of the truth. So I just hope that when people watch the movie, they can better understand what magic is about how they can enjoy magic for themselves and whether they want to be, um, how do, you, do I usually phrase it? Basically ask themselves the question whether it's better uh, to be uninformed and, and fascinated or to be aware and disenchanted. I uh, love that you say that because that's something that... Um I think a lot of people in modern times struggle with, right? You'll be watching something and you've got your cell phone there and it's either you're distracted. So you're not fully engaged, which is, I think, part of the element of, of wonders. People, people don't want to be taken by surprise. So if something's getting a little too serious, they'll just default to that or mm -hmm. they'll just start looking something up immediately. And I think there's incredible value in um, letting a, a play or a, a magician or a movie just take you on the ride and you commit. You know, theaters obviously do that by locking you in a room with a bunch of people who beat you up if you pull your phone out. But uh, it's, it's it's becoming harder and harder, especially with people watching. Um, my 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 girlfriend has a like many people will just pause a movie and be like, well, we'll finish that tomorrow. And I'm like, what? No, oh my <laughs> God. No, <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> we've we, we, we've been watching the goldfinch uh over three days and i'm just like i, I hate this I, <laughs> I love you but i hate this <laughs> yeah i feel you definitely yeah. you know that was uh now i'm jumping around too because i just noticed this note but, but by the uh, way try doing this with a magic trick you're doing the build up and then 50 percent through the magic trick you say okay now remember this card you shuffled we pick up there tomorrow yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually in that uh, uh, when we were talking uh, before we started recording in and of itself, there's uh, an element where an audience member is told, take this book, write something in it and come back tomorrow. And they kick them out before the end of the show and they have to come <laughs> back the next day to see the end and pass the book on to another person. Oh, well, that's and so that is it's a very fascinating way. It, you, I, you guys got to watch it. It's a very good uh, uh, for anyone listening or watching uh, in and of itself is not quite a magic show. It is a magic show, but not really. There's only like three tricks in it. Um, but one of them is incredible. But yeah, there's this element where they kick someone out and, and do have them come back the next day, <laughs> Interesting. Um, which is for that one person. Probably <laughs> gut wrenching. <laughs> um, but uh, magic obviously is not an American trade. But there's so much about it that like, you know, like cheating a casino, for instance, is a very American thing, you know, taking from mm -hmm. the haves and, and giving to the have nots or, or just, it's very anti-authoritarian, which I think is, is kind of ingrained in, in, mm -hmm. in our culture. Um, and it's so it, that element of it, it kind of fascinates me that more people aren't into or that you need more magicians who, you know, like uh, Daniel Madison, whoever, who, who their character is a card cheat. For some reason, the lay people find that much more interesting than, yeah. um, than just a magician, you know. But uh, to your point, it's one about of the characters that that started me with with magic. I even have a signed copy of a book of his in my uh, in my shelf. Yeah. Interesting. You know, uh, you you'll be the only people who can appreciate this. Uh, these two uncut card sheets are signed by uh, Wayne Houchin and Brad Christensen. No way. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, wow. Let's see. That one, the the um, gaff deck is Wayne Houchin. Wow, uh, that's met, so cool. I met them in, two. what's it say? 2004, 2006? Yeah, the, those things have traveled me through college, through high school, but now they're in the <laughs> okay. apartment. I, I, I tell you what, because I think you're going to appreciate this, and then we can switch back to film and then leave okay. uh, magic. <laughs> and, uh, I have 20 uncut sheets of my uh, very uh, own deck of cards. Uh, if your break gets through customs. I sent you one of those. And if you like, we can also sign it to uh, Mark and I, if you, I, if you want. I would love that more than anything. And I will <laughs> frame it 
to match and I will put I'm so the the mirror. Uh I will put it there. Uh oh. and that's it'll go up next to my other because that's actually one of the side not film questions I wanted to ask you was uh what what emotions do you go through being able to make your own deck of cards because that's certainly something I've wanted to do my whole life. <laughs> uh well after making the decision to spend all your savings on a film, yeah. uh, you, you, you then have to make the decision, okay, now that maybe some money could come in, do you want to spend the first bits that come in to, to create your own deck of cards? Right. And, and like, for some like reason, the answer, the yeah, and for some reason, the answer is yes, I'm going to do that. So... Um, what are the emotions? Um, did you, did you go through and like maintain like, all right, it needs to be this card stock. It needs to have like yeah, this feel. They need sure. to be farrowable, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yes. Although, uh, Turner doesn't like me for it because they farrowed the wrong way around for him, but not for me. And also oh. not for a couple of, <laughs> couple of people I know. Um, uh, I wanted to to uh, work with uh, Katamundi due to the um, stock they use, and I didn't. Uh, I used to hate their stock like two or three years ago. I don't know exactly when they changed it, but now I, it's, it's my favorite card stock of all time. Um, B nine. Uh, no, the 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 thin uh, yeah the B nine and then the, the the slim line finish yep. or something they yeah, call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. same stuff yeah. they use on like cohorts, I think. Yeah. Exactly the yeah. one. Th th those are my favorite. Yeah. Thank yeah. God. So <laughs> yeah. So you're in luck. Uh, this is the stock I used. Uh, and for me, it was, oh, I wanted to build this, this Erdnase brand because Erdnase is something that stuck with me uh, before I made this movie. And it's uh, just like you mentioned, Daniel Madison's um, card cheat character is much more appealing for laymen. And this is also what got me fascinated by, by magic, this sort of dangerous aspect. And then um, I loved this Erdnese mystery from the beginning. So I wanted to create, not, not necessarily a brand, but I wanted to create this little universe around Erdnase. And part of this, the first step was, uh, was uh, the movie. And now with my own deck of cards and card clips and close-up pets and all of this, um, I think um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on a good way in order to, to make this a, a thing or even more of a thing than it already was. Yeah, uh, Mark has fallen asleep. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm used to, to, it. to Yeah, I, but I have to say like to, to your point, um, about it, things being accessible. I, I think the documentary is incredibly like all that conversation we just had very nerdy. No one knows what the fuck we're talking about, yeah. but the yeah. documentary is not that the documentary. I think, I think some of the best documentaries tell you about something you had no idea. I, it's the same thing. Like, like Harry Potter. Uh, well, that's a bad, I mean, it's a, it's a corny example because it's magicians, but and, you know, a movie, any movie that talks about like a secret, underground right near the surface you know um even the jack ryan you know any spy movie any the prestige movie where, but huh, dang it <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah 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 anything where we talk about a a, a secret society or a, or a secret thing happening right underneath normal society before knows. vendetta Maybe. sure yeah 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 um that's a great one uh i think is is fascinating and so when you have a documentary like that when you learn about you know, the pan the the documentary of the pandemic, Tiger King. Like who knew that there was these people who just had tigers and that shit's fascinating, yeah. but no one's no one's a tiger person necessarily, <laughs> you know. Um so I think this documentary does an amazing job of uh both being great for magicians to watch. Like I personally loved it, but I think you could show it to anyone and they would be similarly fascinated because the storytelling is so good. The reenactments are fantastic and um you know, it, it, it's a mystery. Everyone loves a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't get enough. That's why I emailed you guys immediately after I was like, <laughs> I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> this is great. great um, yeah. when Hanyo uh, came to, uh, uh, I have a production company with a couple of, um, uh, colleagues I know from, uh, from film school. And when Hanyo came to us with, uh, with his pitch, we all, we don't know anything about magic. But we like the mystery. Everybody likes a mystery. That's what we thought. And that's what fascinated us. And I think actually from getting a little bit more into magic, I think I 
sort of learned shooting the movie how to appreciate magic. And I, I look at it differently. I think what you described, Tanyo, what happens mm. to hopefully to people who watch the movie definitely happened to me. Oh, that's nice to hear. Never heard that from you. That's cool. Yeah, that is. It, it, it's a. Uh, yeah, that is very nice. Um, I'm I'm gonna have to let you guys go because because I don't want to keep you here all day. I'm, although I'm sure we can <laughs> continue to t- you know we we'll have you back if you'd like. Um, but sure. the uh, <laughs> the the way that I like to end them all uh, end all the podcasts is uh, asking the same two questions, which I think next season I'm gonna change up. But right now they mm-hmm. are. Um, if either of you or both of you were to uh, uh, be programming a double feature, you know, like at a theater, uh, <laughs> what would be the uh, with your film? What would be the other film? So it has to answers. fit. So it has to fit our film or not necessarily. Sort of. You're the one programming the double feature. So it could be a direct contrast. It could be analogous. It could be uh, different. I have another question. Uh, will I be watching the triple feature or do I program it for other people to watch it? Uh, I mean, you'd be watching it, but you're programming it for other people. Okay. Okay. Hmm. It's quite difficult for me because I think this movie is quite different from anything. I've That's seen. what I'm saying. It doesn't, it doesn't, have, yeah, to it doesn't be... have to be. Yeah, sure. It can just be something, you know, like uh, some of the double features I love seeing it, um, like Quentin Tarantino will do them a lot at his theater down the mm. street. Uh, and uh, there it's like. It's like an appetizer. It's so actually one of my favorite was my friend made a movie called Dude Bro Party Massacre three, <laughs> and it's an absurd film. There's not a one or a two, uh, you know, it's 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 a horror film. But it's a comedy. It's like a horror comedy. I highly recommend finding it. It's it's hilarious. Um, actually, I'll send I'll send you a Blu-ray. You send me the card sheet. I'll send you Great. the Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, the opening when we when we first premiered it, the opening was a. Have you ever heard of the the chain um, Sizzler? Mm, like no, it, it it's it's a very it's a, a it's a shitty steakhouse here in America. It's like a it's and they've got like a salad bar like you get, it's terrible. It's not like McDonald's bad, but like uh it's just not it's not good. And there is a there's a character in the film called Sizzler, but there's a uh like 8 minute commercial that Sizzler made and it's absurd. I will I will email you guys this commercial <laughs> just so you know what I'm talking about. Please. But it's a it's an absurd commercial from like the late 80s, early 90s. And so they just played this eight minute commercial at the beginning <laughs> and then played the movie just to get you in the in the it's mood great. to watch something uh-huh. ridiculous, you know. So okay. that's uh, a very long way of explaining uh, <laughs> what how you can program your special your double feature. That's the most I've ever explained this question. I, I, I want Mark <laughs> to answer first. So I have a little bit more time. I to was think. going to say the same thing. You're the director. Ah. Your answer. Um, it's it's quite tough because. Hmm. I I have an answer. I think um, because it would it would also be one of my favorite movies of all time. Ah, now I have to choose between. Now there are, there are two movies uh, that I like both, and they are basically telling the same story, and it's um, Black Swan and Whiplash. Interesting, and uh, they're telling the same story of a artist of an artist that wants to uh, aim for perfection and breaks themselves. Uh, so this is something that fascinates me in general. This is why I like those movies. I like the aspect of perfectionism, and this is also why uh, my movie ends with a very similar sh- shot with this open stage which both movies Black Swan and uh, Whiplash do too. So I would definitely definitely choose one of them and just because it, I get a tiny bit better and it's been my favorite movie for such a long time, I would go with Black Swan, I would think. That's a, that's a fantastic answer. Mark is going to say Men in Black. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think that's a great answer. I don't want to ruin it by uh, saying something else and Hanyo is the director, so... I go with that too. All right, all right. Uh, the uh, second question, maybe easier, maybe harder, uh, <laughs> is is have have uh, well, this is for both of you, obviously, uh, individually. 
Is there a piece of advice um, that you've received or maybe something you read in a book uh, or whatever um, that made you a better filmmaker that, that's kind of stuck with you over the years? Yes. <laughs> uh, I have uh, the, the best. And <laughs> <laughs> I have the best and the worst piece of advice I could share with Lovely. you. Lovely. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to start um, asking that from now on. What's the worst <laughs> piece of advice you got? <laughs> uh, the worst piece of advice I, I received was write what you know. Yes. Because um, what uh, ended up happening in film school after they told us uh, this in the first semester, the first term or something like this, everybody was making movies about lonely student sitting at home. The girlfriend just <laughs> broke up with, uh, with him or something like this. And all the movies we're telling the same story because they yes. told us to write what we know. And was, and by the way, it's the wrong quote. Oh, um, it's supposed to say, um, write what you know is true, which is something completely different. And it brings it to another um, meta level and write what you know is true. You could write about true love and what it means to you. And you could make a movie about this that takes place on Mars. It, doesn't mean what people think it means. So this is the worst piece of advice I've, I've, I've received. That's fantastic because that's, I feel like I was just having that conversation yesterday with someone about the <laughs> write what you know thing and how it ends up. I used to teach at a film school uh, and uh, over on the Universal Backlot and we had a list of rules that the kids were not allowed to do. So it was like single red rose, brick of cocaine, kicking a hobo, briefcase full of <laughs> mysteries. Like there's just this big, and it's because they all, that's all they know. They've only seen four things. They're 13 years old. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's funny that I say this, being a magician, making a movie about magic, right? <laughs> because this is sort of what I know. But there were a lot of things in there that I didn't know. I didn't know about Western, and I don't know how someone feels who wants to commit suicide, which is a part of the movie. So right. if I uh, followed this advice, I couldn't couldn't have made this movie, even though it seems to follow this advice at first. But yeah. Well, and I think too, learning things that you don't know uh, helps build empathy. You know, if if you don't know someone yeah. who's deep in depression, you don't know what that's like to learn. It about keeps that you open person. minded and. This is when you get to do your research. And before I was doing this film, I was researching with my screenwriter for two years. So I didn't know what I was writing about. I had to work for it and, and, and find out what it means. Yeah. So coming to the uh, best piece of advice uh, is um, you have to start. Uh, and then it's very difficult to stop. And this is something that I learned on this project big time uh, because it started out at as only this one proof of concept scene, and it wasn't even a proof of concept scene. It was just uh, my bachelor thesis, basically just my bachelor thesis. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, I knew that this is a topic I want to make a film about. I didn't really know how to do it. And then I shot the scene and then I wrote this concept and I was like, oh, I put so much effort into it and I've been working uh, on this for a year. I can't stop now. So even if then there are some setbacks, you will push and, and keep going because you already put in so much effort. And then after two and a half years, even if something goes horribly wrong, uh, you spend two and a half years on the project. What, what are you going to do? Are you just going to walk away from this? No. So this is the best piece of advice, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. hundred uh, percent. Mark. Yeah, mine is uh, not so so special again, but um, I think the the best best advice probably career wise. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm I would say I'm at the beginning of my career, so let's see how it goes. Hey, me um, too, man. <laughs> but is to to use the opportunities that you get and don't be, especially in the beginning, don't be so picky and think, oh, I'm too good for this. I'm not doing this, but and do oh, I'm. I'm too lazy. I want to have a weekend. Just even though it's sometimes hard and frustrating, especially in the beginning, you work from experience, you learn from experience and you learn also from shitty movies a yep. lot. So just, uh, and if you find people that you work well together, be loyal and stick with them. I think that's, Oh yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, 
and also to your point about taking every opportunity you get, like, you know, obviously if they're not going to pay you a cent and it sounds like a lot of work, maybe you don't have to take that one. But in general, I a hundred percent agree. Always take every job. Cause you never know when someone who's like either super connected or has a, yeah. you know, a crazy career behind, you know, that they're taking with them is also just happening to take this job as like a favor to a friend. You meet them. That's how you truly network, not going to these weird luncheons that people, you know, put together on Facebook where they're like, let's get all the filmmakers together and have a beer. It's like, you're going to meet, maybe you'll meet someone there, but that's not generally where you're going to get work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you so much guys for, for doing the podcast uh, and I, and you've, you've fundamentally changed it forever going forward. I am going to ask what's the worst piece of advice <laughs> because that, I, why did I never think to ask that? That's such a good, cause there's another podcast that felt like a film or arts podcast where they kind of had the same advice question. And I was like, ah, shit, I got to change mine, but I didn't know what to change it to. And that's perfect. Um, but yeah, like I said, guys, the documentary is fantastic. Um, uh, what's the, the website where people can rent it? Um, www.urtnace-movie.com right easy to remember um and then yeah let me know when i can get it uh, on blu-ray because i will absolutely purchase that but um yeah, we're I, on I, it. I, perfect <laughs> uh we you know what if there's a reprint we'll put we can put this uh this interview in the special features <laughs> oh yeah why not <laughs> so i'll just give it to you you can have it um yeah thank well, you thank you, guys. you thank uh, you so much for having us thank you so the, much for having us yeah. definitely pleasure to talk pleasure. to you Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the F at Art Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.